Well, good morning, and I want to make sure that I'm mic'd and everything's working in there great. Okay. So in some of my previous times at Huntington, and it's great to see some familiar faces, I've spoken about leading in the midst of chaos and uh, building a thriving culture. Uh, differentiated from some of the presenters yesterday, my field of expertise is not counseling. Uh, my field of expertise is leadership and how to build teams, how to cast vision. Uh, I describe it as helping the high octane leaders uh, drink jet fuel and, uh, <laughs> and really try and build great things for the kingdom of God. And I think the partnership between these two schools is something very special. Uh, I love the speed, I love the adrenaline of what it means to lead in an everyday environment. I love going from meeting to meeting. I love engaging uh, with problems. I love engaging with incredible people and seeing leaders grow from one place into a senior leader role uh, and thrive. It, it's just the joy of my life. Two weeks ago, uh, the event that I have the honor of leading operations for here in the US, we set all kinds of attendance records and presented some of the best leaders in the world. And my days were full of challenges, decisions, Encouraging my team, sitting with people in pain, listening to customers who had feedback. <laughs> Yet, I have a growing concern for myself and the leaders our culture is producing. When do we stop? When do we pause? Doctors Steve and Twyla Lee yesterday encouraged each of us to be self-aware and self-engaging. Their model suggested the idea of disciplines to help us be self-aware and self-engaging. For those of you who are in the leaders, uh, organizational leadership program, I hope you were paying attention. That applies to us too. As a young leader, I have enormous respect for the wisdom of older leaders and look up to many of them. They are my mentors, they are my friends. Steve and Twyla were a great example of that yesterday. May I be blunt? Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily the norm. There is a difference between getting older and getting better. There is a marked distinction between a leader who is reflective before God and keeps getting better, and those leaders who are just reliving the same lessons and getting older. Mm -hmm. Lest you misunderstand this being about an age thing, I must ask the younger leaders among us, do you think our leadership season, with access to news and input 86,000 seconds a day, is going to be easier for reflection and growth? Will the temptation be stronger for Facebook, for social media, than it will be for our journals and for our Bibles? How will the leaders in this room lead differently? It's going to have to be a choice. Leaders, did you catch how many times yesterday that Dr. Wright, in giving a talk about how to experience pain and crisis and how to lead people through that, he encouraged us to do handwritten notes. And actually, the psychology research is actually bearing itself out here that, yeah, there's actually even a difference between the computerized typing into my phone notes and that handwritten notes. But he encouraged us many, many times throughout his presentation to write handwritten notes to process our loss histories and blessings, to capture stories, to process things. His comment, if you bury something alive, God has a habit of bringing it back. Ooh. Are we processing what's going on in our everyday leadership? So where do we reflect in journal? Where do we process the trauma of our leadership moments? Where do we cry? Or are we all just running too fast? I want to begin this morning with an invitation in the form of a video, and this will be very different than some of your other academic lectures. This is a devotional. Following the video, I'm going to ask us to sit for a few moments in silence. And I'm going to ask you to slow down. If you have a pen or paper, I'm going to ask you to actually start making some notes and reflect. And we're going to give some space for that this morning. 
And so get that out, get ready, because after the video, I will have no remarks for a few moments. We're actually going to do some work this morning. Since the very beginning of time, we've been running. Now, while most of us run to lose a couple of LBs here or there, back in the day, running was another thing entirely. Let me give you just two examples. In prehistoric times, before we developed the ability to fashion weapons to kill our dinner, we outran them, literally. We would track our prey hundreds of miles, driving them to heat exhaustion. It's pretty awesome, I think. And then uh, back in Greece, around 490 BC, a courier by the name of Philippides ran a 149 mile round trip to announce the victory of his people. It is said that he ran the entire distance without stopping, then burst into the assembly exclaiming, we won! He then collapsed and died. As it turns out, running too hard for too long can literally cost you your life, which is actually what I want to talk to you about. You see, sometimes we run two things, but I want to talk about running away. Let me show you.
we reflect on yesterday? And would you call to mind the leadership lessons that you most want us to remember from our time yesterday? Would you take those memories from yesterday and would you prompt us as to what you would have us do next? Father, we know that we are running. May we never run too fast for our souls to catch up. May we sit and would your spirit guide us. Would your spirit help us to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. But God, that's going to take some more time, and that's going to take a slower pace. So God, we want to invite your word into this morning, just a small portion. Would you cement it in our hearts? Would you help us? I pray for these leaders. I pray for these counselors. I pray for these friends. That you would help us to reflect on your word today. Amen. Imagine you get a letter and you are sitting in your chair, probably with a cup of coffee if you hang out with me. And you get an old-fashioned letter. For some of us, among that's paper, pen, envelope, address on the front, stamp on the outside. You open it up. It's from a leader you respect. Here are the words that you read. Lead a life worthy of your calling. For you you have been called by God. Here's the thing. I want you to always be humble and gentle. I want you to be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, there's one spirit, just as, as you have been called to a glorious hope for the future. I want to live in these words from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus this morning for just a few moments. I want to live in this verse together as a community. Many of you know the early church read the letters out loud. They didn't have countless copies of the Bible, remember? That's not how they came. They didn't come uh, with copies from God or they didn't print those Bibles. It would be a church community who would experience a letter like this together. They would read it in a small house, sometimes under lock and key because of their security. They would experience this letter together. And they would receive Paul's words to be patient with one another, making allowance for each other's faults because of their love. And I'm sure some eyes will be shooting, oh, I need to be patient with you, and I need to be patient with you. 
oh yeah, that's right, we've got an allowance with each other because of love. So, we're going to live in this verse, and I'm going to ask you to reflect on some things this morning. I have a series of questions, so if you'll get out some notes, I'm going to ask you to actually respond to some of these questions in your own handwriting. We're putting Dr. Wright's work towards to work this morning. Reflecting on this verse, here's your first question, then I'll give you some space to write. What is your calling? Put simply, if I walked up to you and just asked you, what is your calling? What would you say? What is your why that is driving you to spend days in an intensive in the middle of central Indiana to engage in hard work? <coughs> Leaders, I'm going to steal now from our counseling friends and ask you to look at those words. And I'm going to ask you, how do they make you feel? When you hear Paul's words to lead a life worthy of your calling, what happens in your heart? Do you feel ennobled by that? To be worthy of your calling? Do you feel weight in that? Do you feel shame in that? Do you feel fear? Do you feel courage? Does it raise confusion? What emotions come to mind? Let us live into Paul's dream for how we would love each other in community of Jesus. He calls us to always be humble, gentle, patient, and compassionate, making allowance for each other because of our love. Our work coming ahead. Do we still buy into this vision of leadership? In an era of Twitter wars, sensationalized media, self-promotion, instant access, and powering up, do you ever grow weary of trying a different approach? Can you imagine a world in which leaders would be actually known for their humility or patience? Or is this just outdated? Spend a few moments on the question, what prevents you from living out these attributes? What insecurities lead you to show up with pride and arrogance? What triggers make you want to prove yourself? Who is in the room with, that you're trying to impress? Do you still believe that gentleness is a desirable leadership quality? Who has been gentle with you? Okay, so patience, let's slow, slow down for this one. What is triggering you to lose patience these days? Whose faults are most pronounced these days that need allowance? Finally, let's talk about your relational world. How bound together are you with people these days? Where are you having the rich, unscheduled conversations that inspire your hope? Who are your friends, not your clients? Not the people who work for you or for whom you work. Who are your friends? Just jot some thoughts down. I want you to have some space for that. In this program, we as fellows are dedicated to bringing you world-class content that's going to make a difference in your life and in your leadership. This faculty is amazing. There's a difference between simply receiving content and actually processing content. This is the work that happens in your group settings, but it should also be that work that's happening in your individual reflection. Are you going to just get older, or are you going to get better? And this is one of the major differentiators between leaders who are getting older and those who are getting better. We know from some of our work that 
we don't want people to just be serving at our events and doing work without also doing it from a reflective place. We don't want them to just be going through the motions of serving at the Global Leadership Summit. We actually want them to be rooted in scripture and for the scripture to be uh, put hands and feet to year over year. So I'm gonna close our time this morning by showing you a video that was designed to help cement an ancient spiritual practice called scripture meditation. We challenged of the 15,000 leaders around the country who were volunteers to make the Global Leadership Summit work. We challenged the volunteer leaders to all together as a community engage in memorizing a passage of scripture. Many don't know this, it's just a behind the scenes thing, but it differentiates year over year. I can actually go back to different years ago. Yeah, I remember that Corinthians verse. Yeah, I remember that Ephesians verse. So we integrate this throughout. So I want to watch this video together to meditate for just a few more moments on these words from Paul. Lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. I chose the word united because in today's landscape of division and unrest, I feel like this is our call to action as believers. Because of this love, we serve others with kindness, humility, hope, unity, patience, and love. And this verse reminds us to be united together with one another through the bond of peace. The beautiful part about this phrase, glorious hope, is that it doesn't matter uh, where we are as far as our gifts. Each of us has our own calling. Everybody's part is just as important as everybody else's. We are united in one spirit. God can use the summit to empower people, to equip people. When you work the summit with so many people, you realize that you cannot do it by yourself. Together is the only way we can make it happen. When I'm working, I want to make sure that I represent Christ with a sense of humility. When the scripture says lead a life that's worthy of your calling, I think so many times that makes me want to work harder and try harder and push harder. Things can get very hectic. So much is going on, so much has to be done. It puts me in a position of living with open hands. But as I've been thinking about the word worthy, I think more than anything, it's God saying you already are. He's the one that makes me worthy. Lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Gracious God, gentle, loving Daddy, thank you for entrusting people like us with a calling. Thank you for making us so worthy of that calling. We would not be worthy without you. So, Father, as a group of leaders, and counselors, we commit ourselves again to this dream, this new way that you showed us in the person of Jesus whom we love. 
God, we believe that humility is a virtue we want. We believe gentleness is something that you, through your spirit, can build continually in us. We know that patience is something you have called us to, and Lord, you are patient with us. And God, we ask you to give us a reservoir of love, that the allowance bucket would be so filled that we could actually make room for other people's problems, for their faults, for the ways in which they hurt, and the ways in which we feel pain. God, would you make allowance for those faults? And so God, as a people, we commit ourselves to yet another day of taking in incredible content of being led by your word, of sharing deeply in community. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the group times that you would give the most timid among us a sense of courage. Would you give wisdom to those who are in the group and would you do a type of new thing in these communities that only you can do would they feel a little bit like your early church in which people received certainly challenge but also love one another? Would you do that again today, Lord? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.